Well, while people are uh, filtering into the webinar, I'd like to welcome those that can actually see this at this point. I am Brian McClanahan, the president of the Abbeville Institute. If you've not attended a webinar before, if you're not familiar with the Abbeville Institute, our mission is to explore what is true and valuable in the Southern tradition. And that is 400 years of the Southern tradition, not just one particular period, four years in the 1860s, but also colon the colonial South, the postbellum South. Um, we try to uh, bring out the beauty of the Southern tradition for people to admire and, and cherish. And part of that, of course, is Confederate monuments. And so uh, we have written a lot about that on the website. We've had uh, several lectures on that particular issue. I produced a, a video uh, for the Institute on the Arlington Confederate Arlington, Arlington Cemetery Confederate Monument, uh, which, of course, is now slated for destruction, which is why I wanted to have our distinguished guest on tonight, Case B. Lee, who has written a lot about that recently. So uh, before we I, I turn it over to him for a minute, I just want to talk about a couple things with the Institute. Again, if you're not familiar with the Institute, um, we do have a wonderful website, abbeyvilleinstitute.org. Uh, we have a podcast that we do once a week. We produce five articles a week. We also have videos and conferences. We have a wonderful conference coming up in April of 2023 at uh, Callaway Gardens in Pine Mountain, Georgia. It's our 20th anniversary conference. So if you want to know more about that, just click on the events section on our website and you can see about that. Also, this uh, webinar is being recorded and you will get a link to it since you signed up for it. But we also have something called Abbeville Academy. If you want to pick up any of our old webinars, you can go out there and do that as well. So. We have a lot of great resources out there for you, and we do appreciate you coming on to the webinar. Uh, Mr. Lee is the new Urbanism Fellow at American Conservative, uh, which, of course, is a magazine founded by Pat Buchanan. So uh, that's it's a great magazine. If you don't read it, uh, you should take the time take the time to go out and, and pick it up or go and read their website. Um, he has contributed to a number of books on architecture. He is a a, uh, a just has a wealth of knowledge about public art and architecture. So we're really excited to have him on here. And of course, I was first introduced to him through an article he wrote for City Journal. And we'll talk about that a little bit tonight. Uh, but uh, Mr. Lee, would you uh, like to introduce yourself a little further and tell us who you are? Sure. Um, I live in Washington. Um, I've been writing about public art and architecture for about 30 years. Um I am Virginian on both sides, uh, mother and father, though I uh, grew up in Washington. And um, I, my schooling, I would say, was Northern. And, um, uh, but I did occasionally visit Richmond, my father's hometown, growing up. Um, both my, uh, uh, two of my godparents were Richmonders. And but it was only uh, well into adulthood that I got to know Richmond better and appreciate the city and appreciate Monument Avenue. And so what happened in, um, uh, in the year 2000 uh, was deeply shocking. And I, I, I really wasn't prepared for it. I just couldn't believe what was happening. And um, I uh, have been writing about monuments in terms of their formal qualities and in terms of their essential social role. And um, I would say I'm looking at them in a, I've been looking at them in a way that goes deeper than partisan politics. And, um, I guess what has ups one of the things that's upset me most about um, what has happened to Confederate monuments and also any number of monuments in the North um, is um, uh, is the lack of an effective um, apologia for the in permanence of monuments that um, are politically debatable. They have a value that transcends um, contemporary partisan squabbles. 
And 25 years ago or so, we were in a place where people could put critical distance between themselves and Confederate monuments. I'm talking about European liberals who visited Richmond and were charmed by the beauty of Monument Avenue and are used to the idea that monuments, historic monuments, uh, reflect values that are can are obsolete, debatable, et cetera, et cetera. But they were able to appreciate the aesthetic contribution of the monuments to um, uh, to Monument Avenue and place great value on that contribution. And um, uh, for instance, and a great academic example of that kind of mentality was a book called uh, Great Streets, written by a University of California at Berkeley professor of urban planning named Alan Jacobs, and it appeared in the mid '90s. And it was uh, it was a um, like a survey of the great streets of the world. And lo and behold, Monument Avenue is in there. It and Monument Avenue to me is is like tops for American urbanism. So it was entirely appropriate that, that it be in this collection. But you know, the, Jacobs, he didn't rant about the monuments on the avenue. He, he just made passing reference to their formal contribution to one of the great urban landscapes. And it was like, um, of course, there are descendants of the warriors. Of course, there are people who very much resent the Confederate cause and so on and so forth. But there, there is this, um, Jacobs was able to see that the avenue was a beautiful place and that the beauty mattered. And the politics, you know, they were the politics of the monuments, um, just wasn't the only thing to take into consideration. And what is not being taken into consideration, uh, one thing that's not being taken into consideration is the aesthetic contribution of the monuments. You just don't see it. You just don't, it's not there. And the Monument Avenue is a great artistic achievement. It's a great aesthetic achievement. And that, why that is just been canceled is, well, the fact that it's just been canceled is a sign of our political, very pathological political situation uh, where politics has sort of become a medium of salvation for some people. And it's very sad. So I, you know, there's this tendency to dumb things down to, to, to be historically ignorant, dumb things down, how you can pin the label hate on the Robert E. Lee monument on Monument Avenue. It ju it's just, it's it's beyond me. It's, it's, it is a real sign of pathology. So I, my, I guess one concern I have is that the, at this point is how do we educate the public? Um, the public to appreciate the value of these monuments in uh, in all their complexity, and um, because they're, I'm I'm very disturbed by the lack of an effective um, an, an effective um, uh, way of communicating the value of these monuments in non-simplistic, non-woke terms. There's just, it's like there's no alternative, and that's very disturbing. Yes, I mean, I think you the, the part about educating, you, you hit that nail on the head there. It's, um, it's hard to reach a public that's not really uh, functionally literate anymore, particularly yeah, on I art. Agree. I and agree. Um, you, you brought up something in one of your articles I laughed out loud. It's one you wrote a little while back, but you said that the... Uh, the Orrin Hatch building in, uh, is the is the American Borg cube, which I thought was hilarious. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if you don't, if you're not a Star Trek fan, you wouldn't get the reference. But right. 
the uh, the Borg in Star Trek were the assimilators. You must be assimilated. Everyone had to be the same. And so you have this hideous building. It's a block. It doesn't, it, it, it's the most disgusting thing you would see. And so this, I think, is part of it. Um, you know, when I went to the University of South Carolina, uh, I attended a classes in a building called Gambrell Hall. And it's like the 1960s communists came over and built that building. Yeah. And so what we're seeing, I think, in a lot of ways, and actually one of the questions was, what kind of influence does Marxist ideology certainly have on this process? If any, if you can speak to that at all, but you see it in architecture, you see it in, in monuments. The, the communists, of course, uh, did like to tear things down. So um, in, in the Soviet Union, they tore everything down. In fact, they even made their own instruments, some of this weird stuff they did. Um, so is that part of it? I mean, is there something going on there that... Yeah, well, I do, think, ideology? I do think the left, uh, I can't speak to its universal Marxism. Certainly BLM has Marxist origins, as you well know. Um, yes, the, the militant left is well aware of the symbolic value um, of monuments and even more aware of the symbolic value of destroying them. Right. I mean, it, it, they seem to be uh, intent on not just tearing down Confederate monuments, but even wrote a, an article Absolutely. on Lincoln. Right. It's 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 Lincoln. Uh, they're going after Lincoln now. And, and this is something that anyone could predict. In fact, well, I think they're, they, that the real the, there's a real underlying urge to um, to delegitimize uh, white Europeans presence on this continent. I mean, just completely delegitimize it. And so uh, it, it's, and the weird, weird thing is that this is being propagated by white academics. But, you know, if you, everything about, um, uh, there's just so much uh, conventional political discourse from the left, you know, the, the white, the white man, uh, uh, stole the Indian's land, uh, imported slaves. Uh, it's just prog progress from one system of injustice to another, leading inevitably to systemic racism. And um, really, this, there's this, um, this underlying hostility to the legitimacy of the European presence on this continent. Well, let's go back to your talk about Richmond and Monument Avenue. And um, I was the only time the last time I attended was in the late 90s. And uh, now I would not even want to go back. Um, but what is it about Monument Avenue that made that so spectacular and special? I know I had a reaction to it. Of, you know, it was it was all you look at these monuments and they're beautiful and go to the artistic side of it. What about these monuments? Uh, made it something that people in Europe and other places would look at and say, this is a full expression of Western civilization and, and the height of Western civilization in a lot of ways. From an artistic side, what made that possible? Well, um, that's a very good question. Uh, so when you have um, architecture and particularly residential architecture like you have on Monument Avenue, it's basically an abstract art. It's about um, uh, abstract arrangement of masses, abstract alignment of cornices. It's not intensely figurative. There will be some figurative ornament. And the counterpart to that is the figurative monument. It's the human figure. And so you have the interplay between the figurative monument and the abstract rational lines of the architecture. And so it's, it's the full artistic menu. And there is also the fact that the monuments are scaled to the avenue. And uh, they are in a, a beautiful proportional relationship in terms of their size to the avenue. 
uh, they are nicely spaced between one from the other. They sort of punctuate um, a mile long segment of the avenue or did punctuate. Um, so the only um, street in the United States that I think compares um, is Commonwealth Avenue in Boston. Um, but that is a broader avenue and the buildings, um, the, the, the interplay between the buildings and the monuments isn't, doesn't resonate as, as strongly uh, as it did on Monument Avenue. Uh, not Commonwealth Avenue is a great avenue, uh, but I would put, I would rank mon, uh, the old Monument Avenue, the Monument Avenue we had above it. Now, as far as the artists that were involved in that, um, and you know, people coming into this may not know some of these people. So, can can you speak to any of the artists involved in Monument Avenue that are? I mean, their work some is of them, erased. some of them. Uh, now, uh, I am a real classicist when it comes to sculpture. So, um, when it comes to the statuary in Monument Avenue, I'm sorry, the statuary in Richmond, I would say without hesitation that the best honorific statue is Houdon's statue of Washington in the rotunda of the Capitol. Houdon was one of the last thoroughgoing classicists in the Western tradition. And um, I have written, I think this uh, essay uh, is now available, it's, it's no longer subject to the paywall. Uh, 10 years ago, I wrote an essay for the Wall Street Journal, uh, our first president in three uh, in three dimensions, and I talk about um, that statue and also um, the plaster bust um, of Washington at Mount Vernon that Houdon created while he was visiting George Washington at Mount Vernon. Uh, he came from France to visit George Washington at Mount Vernon. He was actually hoping to get the equestrian statue commission for the site where we now have the Washington Monument here in D.C. So anyway, to move along, I don't think the statuary, uh, if you move from the Virginia Capitol Rotunda to the rotunda of the Jefferson Hotel with the statue of Jefferson by um, uh, Edward Virginius Valentine. I think I've got Edward right. I think that's his first name. Anyway, definitely Valentine, whose brother founded the museum of that name. Valentine had European training, um, uh, but his, his statue of Jefferson just it just doesn't hold a candle to Houdon's Washington. So moving on to Ver, uh, to Monument Avenue, the statuary for the 19th century, for the this period of what I call academic realism, which is somewhat different from classicism, I have to say. For that period, it's good stuff. I would I would my personal favorite was the Jeb Stewart was the Jeb Stewart. I also very much uh, admire the stone wall on the Capitol grounds, which is still standing. Hmm. That is still standing. That's a good statue. Um, I admire the Robert E. Lee. Um, it's the, 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 the silhouette, you know, when you look at it from a distance, it's just inspiring, that silhouette. Um, but it's it's the cumulative effect. Uh, and when you get to the Maury monument, Matthew Fontaine Maury, that was modernistic. Hmm. That wasn't classical at all. That was a modernistic uh, a monument dating to the 20s. Uh, and it has all these figures strung around the globe and you have, you know, the different climatological conditions that they're, you know, there's a flood, there's a storm because he was, he was a tremendous oceanographer. He was one of the great oceanographers. And um, so uh, so there is stylistic diversity. There was, there was, I have to keep on using the past tense, there was. It's a tragedy that you have to use the past tense because as you describe it, 
this is a place that people could have come to again from around the world and admired the art, but also you get a you get a dose of American history in a way that it's it's gone now. It's it's yes. there's nothing left. And um, whether you cared for the history or not, as you said, European liberals could come over and still look at it and say, well, we might disagree with these people, but wow, I mean, and this yeah, is an important exactly, part. It's just exactly exactly. It's just as if we go to Versailles. No one goes to Versailles and says, you know, it would be great to go and bring back Louis the Fourteenth. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, but you or, can... or the Arc de Triomphe. I mean, I don't want Napoleon running a civilized country in this day and age. No thanks. I it, and yet the Arc de Triomphe is deeply inspiring. Right. And um, so, yeah, exactly. Or the Severin Arch. I mean, no one's talking about bringing back Septimius Severus. Yes. These, these, th 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 it's the historical ignorance, I think, uh, that drives all of this. It's as you said, it's politics has become a religion. And then so you as, as you do that, and of course, we can talk about the origins of that. But um, as you do that, then you have to eliminate the the heretics. And of course, the Confederacy represents the heretics. But as you say, this can also be stretched out to other things. I mean, when well, I when... want to I want to say one thing, because, I, I you know, about uh, the Confederacy, I mean, these are virtue monuments. These are virtue monuments. These are tributes to heroism and sacrifice. And it is just, it's human nature to, to distill the most noble characteristics or aspects of human experience in monuments. And, um, and, and that's, that's pre-political pre-political. And uh, now, you know, it was very, other people can speak to, to the political baggage. I think a lot of that conversation is very um, subjective and very 2020 hindsight. There is something more elementary involved than, you know, um, building monuments to tell black folks to keep their place or to remind black folks, you know, they were they were in a subordinate position for the duration. I don't think that's true. I don't I just don't think that was a fundamental motive for their creation. And uh, um, I so one of the things that's happening um, is as everything gets politicized by the left, this whole pre-political realm of emotional experience um, is, is just factored out. And it's that emotional realm, that pre-political realm of sensory experience, you could call it, tied to our emotional lives. As you edit that out, you're really sort of um, distorting human nature. That's a fascinating point. Um, there was a, a story that was told to me at one time of some Chinese businessmen who came to Texas and they went to Dallas. And of course, if you go to Dallas, you would think that they would want to go and see where Kennedy was assassinated. That's not what they wanted to do. They wanted to go see the Lee Monument. And this is in the 80s. And all they wanted to do was see the Lee Monument. And they they recognized that and they wanted to have pictures taken and so as you said, that emotional experience and that sensory part of this, there's actually a yeah, story. That's South the aesthetic part of it. The aesthetic right. part of it. Yeah. Um, there's a historian at South Carolina who works a lot on sensory history, whether it's, uh, it's sound, it's touch, it's smell. He does these things because that is the human part of all of this story. And when you look at the, the emotional impact that these monuments had on a people that had been defeated, the people that had lost that had suffered lost. suffered right. so much that's what people don't understand how much these people suffered right and so it's that as you see they were donating literally pennies to the to the cause and oftentimes to have these things constructed um and then we just so flippantly disregard them it's a real tragedy agree. uh totally in, agree. in american history now one thing i want to regarding um the communists you know, it's it's ironic because I don't know if those were cultural officials who came to Dallas and wanted to see the Lee Monument, but 
um, the Great Hall of the People in Beijing is a knockoff of the Lincoln Memorial. Um, the, the Chinese have a monument industry uh, based basically on a kind of debased latter day academic figurative mode of instruction. Hmm. The guy who, and this is very sad because I personally think Martin Luther King deserved a hell of a lot better, but the Martin Luther King um, monument on the Tidal Basin in Washington is done by one of these Chinese monument makers. He got the job because cheap stone was part of the package. So wow. Chinese mercantilism. Hmm. And the this deep relief uh, portrait of King is a disaster. Hmm. It's a disaster. Now, so, and in Russia, in Russia, the, uh, I think, let's see, uh, I guess it was when Khrushchev was in power during the 50s, um, they built a, a very impressive classical foreign ministry. They built some very impressive classical hotels and, um, and Moscow State University, I don't know, there was under Stalin because he turned against modernism, there was a a, a, a gargantuan scheme for the main building at Moscow State University with it crowned by a humongous uh, statue of Lenin. I uh, that didn't get built, but again, there, there, they, they, Stalin. Uh, I don't know if it. I guess it was as early as Lenin that they figured out that modernism was a no go with the masses. So you have this complicated relationship in the history of communism between traditional design, modernist design, and the regime. Well, let's transition to the Arlington Monument, because that's the one that people are most upset about right now, I think. Um, people around the United States have you know, kind of uh, you know, forgotten about Monument Avenue in Richmond, but I um, mean, they probably have forgotten about Arlington as well, but I think there's a real effort now to try to save that monument. What is about that monument and the artistic value of it that makes it so important? We know the, the political side of it. It's the Reconciliation Monument. This monument's yeah. actually created yeah. by, uh, you know, in a time period when people are trying to heal the wounds of the war. Yeah. William McKinley, a war veteran, yeah. uh, says we need a Confederate section of Arlington. Taft, as Secretary of War, agrees to put the monument there. Congress follows through. I mean, so you have Republicans doing all of this. And actually, you know, Taft makes a speech and he says, this is the, the benediction of all true Americans, this monument. If you're a true American, you will love this monument. So now we have a process by which this monument could just be raised. We have the, you know, the pedestal maybe left, or at least the the, the foundation. The plinth, the plinth. Just, the plinth. just a three-foot pile of granite. Right. That's what's left. So what is it about this monument, Ezekiel Moses? You write a lot about this. Can you tell us a little of the, of the artistic side of this and how, just from an artistic standpoint, this monument should stay in its place? Well, it's um, he was one of the most gifted American sculptors of his generation. And um, his uh, he had an excellent stone wall statue at VMI, which has been removed tragically. It's now at the Newmarket Battlefield site. Uh, there, that there were two cop. There were there are two uh, uh, casts of that. The other uh, was placed outside the uh, West Virginia Capitol. I don't know if it's still there. Um, and then he has uh, two. Uh, there are two um, um, uh, casts of his Thomas Jefferson monument. One is at the um, I think it's the county courthouse in Lexington, Kentucky, and the other is on outside the rotunda at the University of Virginia, but facing University Road or University Avenue, not the lawn. A very impressive monument, and the Stonewall statue is very fine. Um, so, and he has, he did, he got a number of European commissions. He was living in Rome and the baths of Diocletian, the ruins of the bath of Diocletian. 
And um, so the Confederate Memorial Commission came along towards the end of his career. It 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 was he was a very loyal Southerner of Sephardic Jewish ancestry who fought with the Corps of Cadets at the Battle of Newmarket. And um, and the design, uh, I've never really, I haven't seen a monument exactly like it. There, there, it was definitely influenced by a um, uh, the, the the frieze the, with the life size figures. Um, was definitely influenced by a monument to the Franco-Prussian War designed by a German named Simmering, who uh, who was one of uh, uh, Ezekiel's mentors. The main mentor was a guy named Albert Wolf, who was a very good Prussian sculptor. So anyway, but the de the, de the design overall is very distinctive quite inventive and I think very effective. And, but the main thing that I think is outrageous about this removal um, plan is that the concentric, concentric arrangement of graves calls out for a monumental centerpiece. And this is a funereal monument. And I think it's a gross disrespect to the dead to remove it. Right. I mean, it, it's uh, it's unfortunate. <laughs> the, the the commission's charge was not to to attack anything in a cemetery. Well, last time I checked, Arlington's a cemetery. It's uh, they have graves all over the place, so I guess it counts. But we've been told over and over again, well, these monuments need to be in in museums or in cemeteries. So here you have one in a cemetery and one of lasting historic and artistic value that's being attacked. Um, you did say that in your piece. I saw there was an update that the gravel and fencing to put up is not for taking down the monuments. So that's good news. Yes, there is going to be a historic preservation review process under Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966. And what that um, sec what happens with Section 106 is that there are consulting parties. And um, and the uh, Section 106 is administered by a separate bureaucracy. It's not the Pentagon. And it's a it's a preservation entity um, within the federal government. And um, so one consulting party is the Commonwealth. And the um, the sort of default um, consulting party for the Commonwealth is the state uh, historic preservation officer who is the director of the State Department of Historic Resources. Now, um, the question is, you know, does Yunkin get involved? That's the question. Does he, does he come out and say something? And um, and you know he's just been rolling over up until now, um, so I just don't know what what to expect. But I think I think it, it could depend on the number of consulting parties. Uh, the more there are, the longer the review process takes. But I think it's going to take some time. I don't think the uh, memorial is going to be gone tomorrow. Well, that's good news. Um, unfortunately, we know how these things work, and Youngkin is. Uh, how these things work, yeah. <laughs> Youngkin is. Um, gosh, how to describe him? I, when he was when he was elected, of course, there was a lot of euphoria. I think from the right, we've got this. Republicans have taken back uh, Virginia, but I, I was very cautious about that because he's he's someone that's angling for a career beyond Virginia. And well, he doesn't want to I understand something, uh, Brian. Very important point. Republicans gave up on culture decades ago. Of they course. Gave up. You know, they, they, they said culture is the province of the nut jobs and there's nothing we can do about it. And so one of the key things this um, 
the, the, the Confederate monuments uh, debacle has, has showed is um, Republican cultural ineptitude. And um, this is something that has to be remedied. But like I said earlier, you know, the way things stand now, Republicans look at Confederate monuments as um, an issue that costs them political capital if they take a stand and they don't see any return or an adequate return. That's what's got to change. And that's got, and the change has to start with the public education program or programs, it's not going to be one program, um, to inform people, and I think there are a lot of people who are sort of having a morning after reaction, and um, they know what is ha that what's happened is a disaster. They know that what the newspaper, newspapers and television stations are telling them about the disaster um, really uh, isn't the truth. And um, so I think we're looking, you know, at a, 10 years, a generation of, of trying to make people understand what the real underlying issues are. And in the meantime, the main objective is keeping the statues that have been taken down from being destroyed. Mm -hmm. That is a real danger. Uh, and I would also say um, that that this isn't a this isn't a winner take all. I'm not making a winner take all argument. I acknowledge the need. You know, the cities are governed by the left. The cities are majority liberal, progressive, further left, and um, and they. You know, they're going to symbolize their own convictions, their own interpretation of history. And that has to happen. I, I don't deny it for a moment. But so the whole the whole position for, for conservatives regarding Confederate monuments in the cities, the bigger cities, should have been all along addition, not subtraction. Addition, not subtraction. Right. I, I don't think that was ever going to be the, the the agenda. It was always going to be subtraction. And, you know, Youngkin had the opportunity when he was uh, first inaugurated. To, he could have put him back up. He could have taken a stand right then. And when he didn't, that was it. I, I think that it's very clear that uh, Young, Youngkin was never going to do it. And of course, the the uh, legislative effect that we've had in this, where you slap a $25,000 fine uh, for covering a monument. I mean, we've had rich leftists just say, I'll pay the fine. Who cares? We'll do it every day. Yeah. So they need to be higher. I mean, there's some things that need to happen to try to stop this. And of course, in states like where I live, Alabama, um, the the uh, the state could have just said, well, if, if you take these down, we can just uh, remove your incorporation. You're no longer a city and we'll take it over. But yeah, as you said, the political capital, the, the repercussions for, for doing that or not doing that are not there. And the Republican Party has always been called the grand old, well, at least recently, the grand old stupid party because they make a lot of stupid mistakes and they don't really understand who their real constituents are. So um, I want to get into the questions because we have a lot of them and we're, we've are we got about 20 minutes left. Um, so I have to go through these because there's, there's a ton here. Um, let me go back to the bottom. Um, he said, oh, one question, this is a good one. Are there any sculptors alive today who have the skill and would be willing to create new Confederate memorials and monuments? Is there anybody you know of that could do something like this um, in, in, in the United States, in Europe, anywhere that might be interested in something like that? That's a good question. Um, the, I don't think there are, any American sculptors who could uh, equal the Robert E. Lee on Monument Avenue or the stone wall in Charlottesville. The stone wall in Charlottesville was one of the best equestrian statues in the country and unappreciate, underappreciated relative to the Monument Avenue Lee. Uh, I find it hard to believe we could equal those nowadays. 
Um, I still think, yes, there are sculptors who could make contributions, uh, worthy contributions, uh, monumental contributions. Um, yes, I do. Um, the thing is, we're we're in you know we're in the incipient stages of a recovery of a culture of a, a visual arts culture, and it's going to take a long time to do. It embraces architecture, painting, sculpture, even urban planning, and um, you just got to keep on doing it. You know, you just can't. You don't deliver a masterpiece after three quarters of a century of cultural dysfunction. So I think the, uh, the, the, the answer to the question is that that avenue should be pursued. You know, you talk about culture, and one of the things with the Institute that we do is, is try to address cultural degradation. And, and uh, the Southern tradition has a lot to offer there. I mean, it's um, as far as literature, music, there's a lot. And, and I think the problem is that, as you said, most Americans aren't interested in these things anymore. It all comes down to they're interested in economics or politics. And they don't see the value in culture, but culture bubbles up, or I'm sorry, politics and economics really does bubble up from culture. Yeah. You can't have one without the other. And so if the culture is oh. degraded, your politics will be degraded, your economics will be degraded, and it all just falls apart. Yeah. Um, and the reflection of that often is the public art. What yeah. kind of people do you have when you look at the scene? And so we had a question about New York City or any major American city. Yes. You go and you look at the way that buildings are now constructed, and you brought up, you know, the the Borg, the Borg cube there. But other buildings, yes. speak to that for a minute. How are these cities now a reflection of the writ large of our cultural degradation in America? Not just the poverty and the crime and everything else, but the the aesthetic value of the cities. You're making an extremely important point because the United States is the first world power in human history, which has witnessed the catastrophic decline of its public art and architecture. It has never happened before. And um, and New York is the great showcase of that. Um, now, it's very interesting because the arts have increasingly um, architecture, fine art, um, especially, have increasingly turned into commodities. They used to be conceived as artifacts of enduring value. They've been, been increasingly commoditized. And, um, and so the National Gallery of Art West Building, I emphasize West Building in Washington, was built as a 500-year building. The, uh, we don't do 500 year buildings anymore. And um, we do building, we do buildings as commodities. Um, and, um, you know, it's hard. It's, it's, I can imagine modernist buildings because of building codes whose concrete cores last for a long time, but the envelope around the, those structures is ephemeral, hmm. ephemeral. And um, so uh, to, with federal architecture, which is a big concern of mine, as, as, as you know, that's how, that's how we got to the board cube. Um, the, 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 um, the classical architect, who gets who's or or the architect because he's not likely to be a classicist. He's a guy who's going to have to have to bone up on his classicism uh, to do a classical courthouse as required, say by your former senator Richard Shelby, who was a real source of enlightened patronage. Hmm. Uh, he has to design a, a a building in a language conceived for enduring artifacts on a commodity budget, on a commodity budget. It's tough. Mm -hmm. But the good news is there's a, a, a pretty fine new courthouse in Tuscaloosa. It's 10 years old. 
but so they're they're in all the arts you have this issue of you know um how much am i willing to pay to create something that lasts for centuries that matters for centuries and uh or am i just going to make a splash an ephemeral splash well you know um, i'm right near fort benning i live near fort benning georgia which is now going to be fort how more um and uh, i have a funny story with that there was actually a student i was walking him through a uh, cemetery there it's limwood cemetery in columbus georgia and it's a beautiful cemetery the art the artistic value of the cemetery is tremendous you don't even, cemeteries even that's another issue in and of itself yeah, it what is. we do with cemeteries it is. now it but, is. but we and were walking see the changes the cultural changes from the older grave sites to the newer grave sites absolutely yep. and so we're, henry benning is buried there and I made a statement about Henry Benning, and this student was an African American student, and he said, "Well, why are they changing the name?" And I said, "Well, some people are offended." He said, "Well, that's really stupid. <laughs> it was just matter. That's really stupid." Um, but the the fact is, you know, we just seem to flippantly think that well, everybody would be offended by this. But here, I think when when people are told and see the artistic value of, of these places, and they they actually admire it. But um, another another question coming up about art deco many post offices modern 50s 60s 70s it seemed to be art deco no, what no, happened no. In... before that before that before okay that. so art what deco happened is the 30s okay well what happened uh in in the 60s in the 70s um where you started getting these just hideous structures being built all over the place columbus georgia had a beautiful old courthouse they tore it down and put up this monstrosity yeah. uh, that now, I mean, it leaks, it's awful, but you know, yeah. Yeah. this beautiful courthouse yes. gone for this ugly yeah. thing that they put in the middle of the city. So what happened there in the sixties and seventies? Well, uh, the first thing that happened is that the leading architecture schools went modernist and uh, Columbia was first, Harvard was second. Um, and the the guy who flipped Columbia was an Englishman, uh, and he moved from Columbia to Harvard. But uh, the guy who really made waves was uh, Walter Gropius, who uh, was the leading light of the Bauhaus in Germany. And he left Germany uh, with at least one sidekick and um, having been invited to take um to, to assume the reins at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. Mies van der Rohe, uh, also a German modernist uh, who'd been hoping for commissions from Hitler, but that didn't pan out. So he came to the States and he established himself at the uh, Illinois Institute of Technology in Chicago. Uh, Mies, uh, built the Seagram building on Park Avenue in Manhattan uh, in the 1950s. And the Seagram is um, very symptomatic because it's a corporate office building. Corporate America bought into modernism big time. And so you'll see tons of um, um, modernist office buildings in New York and other cities where the architecture is modernist. And, you know, they'll have this weird sculpture in front by some name artist. And, you know, it was corporate America's way of saying, we're au courant, we're not fuddy-duddies. And this was... Um, Corporate America is a big part of the modernist triumph in this country. And I don't think, I'm not sure people really understand that. One of the things we've often done as we've talked about monuments is look at this in a, in a comprehensive way where you don't just have Confederate monuments. Of course, the argument is, well, all these monu monuments are put up to celebrate Jim Crow. But we also know at the same time, there are, being union, there are union monuments being constructed across the North. What is the similarity between the two artistically? Are they are they the same? And you said, you know, they're they're memorials, they're virtue monuments. Even mm -hmm. in the north, it's the same thing. So yes. from an artistic side, how do you respond to that argument? Well, 
These are just about Jim Crow and white supremacy because we can find some guy that made some statement in a speech somewhere that he was a racist. Well, okay, so all Amer- I mean, you would be hard pressed to find many Americans who weren't in the late 19th, early 20th century. So, yes, yes that's uh, totally true. Totally um, so, how do you how do you put the two together? Um, you've got Union monuments, you've got Confederate monuments. This is the healing period of time. What Union monuments would be similar to, say, some of the Confederate monuments being removed in the South? Well, you have the equestrian statue for the general was universal, universal. So here in Washington, we've got General Scott at uh, at Sixteenth um, in Massachusetts. We've got General Thomas at Fourteenth in Massachusetts. We've got um, General Grant at the foot of Capitol Hill. They're all equestrians. Um, and then we've got, uh, you've got plenty of soldier statues um, in the north. Uh, you, you find one um, in Central Park. Uh, so in terms of genre, you know, the, 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 the general on horseback, the solitary soldier, those are our uh, universal. And then you have more particular, more distinctive monuments. Um, and uh, the grant at the foot of Capitol Hill is one because it's so ambitious. There is a there is an um, cavalry group on one side, an artillery group on the other. There are bas reliefs. Um, it's very ambitious. Um, and then the Confederate Memorial at Arlington is uh, very ambitious and um, as distinctive as any uh, Civil War monument I know. So I would say, I do think there was um, in the South uh, a a a sentiment that we're not going to let the Yankees have all the fun with monuments. You know, we're, we, we've got something to say, too. We've got things to be proud of, too. We're going to build our monuments. Now, you see, the thing is, the the North um, got off to a start sooner because Confederate monuments couldn't go up during Reconstruction. Mm-hmm. So to an extent, the South was reacting to a northern phenomenon that's my take that's my take i think it but i i think it would have happened anyway i what i'm saying is there was an element of competition i do think southern confederate monuments would have gone up anyway but there was an element of competition uh the um the lee monument association in richmond definitely wanted a monument um that would bear favorable com- favorable comparison with any Civil War monument in the North. We know I, here. I, 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 let me ma- mention one thing before before it slips my mind. In terms of distinctive monuments, um, the um, I, I, perhaps the most distinctive is um, Augustus St. Gordon's Shaw Memorial on the Boston Common with the 53rd Massachusetts. Uh, St. Gaudens didn't do any Confederate monuments, but he did recommend the Frenchman Mercier for the Lee Monument in Richmond. And yes, I mean, you had you had European sculptors looking at this as a grand opportunity to showcase their arts, and it didn't matter if it was north or south. They were interested in how they could best display these virtues and traits of all of these people and the French were well aware of defeat. I mean, they had you had you had Confederate former Confederates who took up in France because they understood what it was to lose in the Franco-Prussian War. And so there's there's a lot going on there, and um, we forget that. Um, now, uh, another question: What can we do about the degradation of Western art? And if we don't have any control of government, how do we do this? And I, well, I mean, um, I'll I'll let you answer that. I have a little response to that. But what do you think about that? I mean, you you are the artist, so how do we how do we handle this issue? Well, I th- to me, you know, on so many fronts, we're seeing the lesson that conservatives 
need to have a cultural policy. And um, the, the challenge uh, for architecture is uh, that conservatives are tend to be tight logs. And so they don't want to fork out a lot of money for a courthouse that will last, you know, for centuries. Uh, they want it built on a tight budget. Um, and uh, you can do classicism on a tight budget that's better than the modernist alternative. But you're not, if you look at this um, federal courthouse from 1910 in Cleveland, designed by a New Yorker named uh, Brunner, and he brought in all these, he, Daniel Chester French has two sculpture groups in front. There's a tremendous amount of mural painting. The, uh, the architectural de decoration is stupendous. The courtrooms are awe-inspiring. Um, you know, that wouldn't pass muster now. It's just, it just, it's too costly. And yet that courthouse will be there forever. Mm -hmm. And with some of the older courthouses elsewhere around the country, the layouts are impractical for the latter-day courthouse, whose security needs have changed, for instance. But they become city halls. That happened in Tuscaloosa. It's happened in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. It's happened elsewhere. And um, so building enduring value as a cultural value, that's a challenge. That's a, that's a real conservative ethos, but it's a challenge nowadays. I think a part of this is to try to rescue the idea that arts are conservative and they're not the the home of the left. I mean, and so uh, at least in terms of an aesthetic and cultural standpoint and the value for tradition. Um, now, one quick question is something we haven't talked about and um, we don't have much time left, but Stone Mountain in Georgia. Um, what do you think about the relief there? Um, it's, uh, of course, it's under the control of the governor, so he would have to agree to have it sandblasted. Um, but it's constantly under attack, uh, and there's always an effort to try to get rid of it. Artistically, what do you what do you think about the the monument itself? Not much, honestly, not much. I just don't think it's very good sculpture. Well, you know, I, I don't even you know I, I I'm just just purely artistic uh, uh, appraisal. Uh, I don't think Mount Rushmore is very good either in terms of the amount of formal content in the figures uh, in the in in those busts at Mount Rushmore and in the uh, and and in the uh three figures at Stone Mountain. I, I just it's 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 not great work. Well you know it's um it is such a uh, a tremendous visual scene though. You know, of course if you yes, I understand that. I don't favor its removal. I yeah. do not favor Stone Mountain's being sandblasted. I oh, no, I, I'm, I'm not saying you do. As, as you go down, of course, you look at the monument from a distance. It has this, again, a visceral reaction to it. Wow, this is a you know massive yeah. thing. And, you know, Mount Rushmore and has that this. that was what yeah. Gutsum Borglum, the sculptor, was about. Just overpowering you with magnitude. Mm -hmm. um, he was a pupil of, an, of one of the um, early modernist sculptors, Rodin. And um, I'm just not a big fan of his sculpture. Yeah, Rodin is something else. Yes. <laughs> so that will be a whole another topic. Well, we're up, against, topic. <laughs> we're up against the time here. And this has been a lot of fun talking about this. And again, we have to emphasize the importance of the arts in a tradition, uh, in the Southern tradition, in Western civilization. Of course, one of the things, you know, that anytime you're a classicist, you're going to run into is that, well, you're saying this and this is European centered and uh, we have to incorporate everything else. So um, you're going to run into those arguments, which we you did kind of touch on with the GOP and um, how that would work. But certainly uh, this is something we need to continue to have a conversation about. And I'm very happy that you're doing this at the American Conservative and that you're bringing culture back into that mainstream magazine. I think that's what's been lost in so much of American political discourse. But Mr. Lee, it's been a fun time having you on here. And I thank everybody for coming out to this webinar. It is recorded, so we will have it again for a replay. So if you missed it or you missed some of the some of the event, you can go back and listen to it later. But um, I thank you for coming out and thank you for giving us your time. My pleasure, Brian. Great talking with you.
All right, everybody, again, uh, we'll, we'll, this is our last one for 2022, so we will see you in 2023 for more of these. And of course, stay in touch with us at the Abbey Bill Institute website. And everyone have a very good evening and a Merry Christmas. See you in 2023. Good night. Good night.